Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really inspired by all the work that is being led by people in this room and involved in this. And um, I'm really grateful for the chance to help open up our conversation about driving this revolution in the way people think about the value of nature and the way we account for nature in real world and big deal decisions. So it's incredible to see the transformation that's underway. And um, <clears throat> we can see a little bit into it looking at this um, tea plantation here in Uganda. So looking at the foreground, we can imagine the value of the tea plantation itself, the value of sort of the health and the skills and the dedication of the workers involved in so carefully tending and producing that tea. We can imagine all the values associated with, say, the corporations that package up that tea and market and distribute it around the world. And, and then we ourselves, if we've enjoyed tea this morning, you know, we know, we have an idea of the values involved in that ecosystem in the foreground. We're a government helping to regulate what goes on there. Then we too have a value um, associated with that ecosystem in the foreground. But look at the system in the background, the cloud forest. While for hundreds to thousands of years, we've developed institutions to kind of secure and maintain the productivity and the understanding of the system in the foreground, until very recently, we've had little attention to the system in the background at our sort of global, modern day economic level. But today, we see more and more of a transformation underway in looking at that cloud forest and recognizing the role that it plays in stabilizing our climate globally, in supplying water to downstream communities, whether to hydropower producers, to irrigators, to <clears throat> producers in agriculture, to big cities. We recognize the biodiversity there, the many products in pharmaceuticals and many other things that come to us globally from the treasures in that cloud forest. But how do we bring that to the fore? How do we begin to think much more systematically, develop a universal language and approach for incorporating the system in the background there, really accelerating the evolution of our institutions to bring that systematically into decision making. <clears throat> we need to think much more crisply about natural capital. So, you know, we're good at thinking about physical capital, the sort of man-made stuff, financial capital, human capital, our health, knowledge, skills, social capital. We've only begun to get our arms around natural capital in a formal way that's really actionable. What is natural capital? <clears throat> well, it's simple. Earth's lands, waters, and biodiversity. We're talking about living natural capital. And we can easily appreciate our dependence on natural capital, thinking about, well, what if we went off to the moon, thinking about the astronaut there in the space station. You know, how long would we last on the moon? We are utterly dependent, as we all know, on <clears throat> the living and thin layer of life around our beautiful and unique planet Earth. Around, we're dependent on this system, the life support systems that Earth's lands, waters, and their biodiversity make up, and that supplies us with every aspect, basically, of our physical and mental well-being and many, many dimensions of our economic prosperity. We, we could not live for an instant without this. Yet we all know um, that through our aspirations, our great numbers, um, we're rapidly degrading and depleting natural capital. All around the world, we're losing forests and wetlands and coral reefs and other systems. But in a way, that's what offers us this incredible opportunity today as we lose these, we wake up, we recognize with the increasing scarcity, um, the value held in natural capital. And what we can see now is a new approach developing to bring that value into decisions and harmonize people and nature. Well, how do we think about the values of natural capital? Let's just dive into that. 
until pretty recently at a global scale in our globalizing you know, economic system, we had basically a blank page on that. Um, <clears throat> and it's only recently now that people have started to design a really systematic way of thinking about you know, shining a light on all the connections in our day-to-day -day lives from the minute we wake up through to that moment when maybe we're a little depleted at the end of the day, but of how nature delivers the, the life support that we need and all the things that make life fulfilling. Um, <clears throat> so looking across at these many elements of natural systems and how they interact with cities, with our food production, with how we regulate um, hydropower for energy production, clean water supply, and many other things, we can become quite systematic about the dimensions of nature that deliver these benefits. <clears throat> and this revolution, we can go back um, not long ago to the early 90s when two disciplines at war, ecology and economics, came together to start harmonizing the way we think about this. And then some of the world's greatest heroes began developing pioneering approaches to implementing that knowledge. In New York City, for example, realizing it was economically a lot more sensible to invest in watershed protection, wetlands and farmland up in the Catskills to secure drinking supply than build a filtration plant. And then Tom Lovejoy actually bringing this model to Quito, Ecuador, and now seeing it spread across many parts of the world. <clears throat> we can also look at Napa in California, the famous wine growing region, that, whose city actually was really depressed. Even the bakery was boarded up. That's a real sign of a depressed city. Um, <clears throat> and yet they then opted after years of devastating flooding to move over 100 buildings and nine bridges reestablish this wetland shown on the left and secure the city and revitalize the place. Another key example was Costa Rica developed the first ever nationwide payment system for these values of nature, the ecosystem services that flow from tropical forest conservation and restoration. So <clears throat> thereafter we saw rapidly sort of a systematization of this universal approach with hundreds to even thousands of little examples coming up somewhat boutique and re relatively isolated around the world of moving knowledge into action. And now what we see, Natural Capital Project is one of many international efforts underway to drive this new, this really innovative approach into action much more widely to mainstream and scale up. And I'm gonna give you an example from China you might think that sounds crazy with all the disaster we read about in China. And indeed, it, it was kissing disaster and biblical flooding, devastating air quality, water quality, and other problems that trace to deforestation in the case of flooding, loss of wetlands as well, <clears throat> and other you know, environmental devastation that has led to a dramatic investment in, in this revolution. And it's pretty simple. There are these key elements here, the understanding together with leaders of the values of nature, codifying that understanding in tools that are actionable and that decision makers who are not you know, PhD scientists, normal people sitting in corporations, in government offices, in communities can implement in new demonstrations, all supported by an international platform that keeps advancing the innovation. So in China, after kissing disaster, um, President Xi Jinping in 2012 declared the country's dream as becoming the ecological civilization of the 21st century. And China's investing more than any other nation now in realizing that dream. And I'll just give you a really quick sketch. So um, embracing officially this approach to quantifying values of nature, using the software that we've developed together invest for integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs <clears throat> in, um, you know, now it's been adopted in many countries worldwide, but in China, no other place has been as focused on training people in just the first phase of training. Um, all, basically all provinces had officials in key state labs and government offices learning how to use this 
integrating it with global data, and then developing their own data in China. Detailed, high-resolution data with um, a lot of it driven by remote sensing and a whole bunch, over 100,000 ground-truthing sites to calibrate you know, what's going on on the ground vis-a-vis -vis what we can see with satellites so that they have a system of natural capital accounts where you can pinpoint exactly what's, what food is grown of the many different crop types in China, where water is held and slowly meted out to regulate hydropower production, um, irrigation, minimize the risk of dry season flows to cities. You can pinpoint you know, where carbon is being stored, where it's being lost. If you're worried about sandstorm protection in the northeastern cities, you can pinpoint which grazing communities are involved in either stabilizing or depleting you know, the ability of grasslands, shrublands, to secure um, what goes into those sandstorms, secure it to the ground. And biodiversity is a huge part of this system of accounts. And then using that system of accounts, they're developing a green financial system that's in early stages at one level, but get this, <clears throat> they've used INVEST to map out the country into priority zones with these national scale priorities. Biodiversity is always in there, interestingly, as a key ingredient and engine of securing and providing resilience in the delivery of ecosystem services. And these zones now span 49% of the country. In these zones, as part of the green financial system, there's eco-compensation and many other mechanisms for compensating and rewarding, incentivizing people to restore and protect natural capital. Over 200 million people are being paid today and every day to do this in, in all of these priority areas. And um, suddenly, oh, I see, while wow, the clicker stopped. Um, so, okay, I won't show further slides, but I'll just wrap up by um, saying that in, in, in a final sentence here, oh, I see, okay. Well, they're demonstrating this in some key places. All of this work is demonstrated in key pilots and uh, just going further. And in addressing the many dimensions of poverty, understanding how a payment, for example, can best be tailored to people living in remote regions whose livelihoods are intimately connected with the well-being of the entire country and indeed the world. And then um, finally, the country is <clears throat> developing a new metric, having used GDP to measure progress over the past many decades. China is saying, okay, we're, we can't just fly blind on the planet with GDP as our metric. We know how much is missing from that. So they're developing a parallel metric that will be reported alongside GDP, gross ecosystem product. And um, in all of this, I just wanted to underscore how much they're investing in science innovation and how much Ouyang and other leaders being rewarded with the highest medal that the Chinese government gives and interacting with the global community to advance worldwide now, more than 50 countries, many companies, many communities and cities using these natural capital approaches to make really pioneering institutional change that drives you know, economic investment in natural capital for the tremendous returns we get to human well-being. And just the last thing I'll say, reflecting on Confucius and thinking again in the China context, um, <clears throat> A lot of this movement, in a way, is oriented around what Confucius said so long ago, that there are three paths to wisdom. The first is through contemplation, and that's the noblest, and a lot of us are involved at that level. The second path is through imitation, and that's the easiest, and we're all hoping, in a way, that if we demonstrate powerful new approaches, they'll be easy to imitate elsewhere. The third is through experience, and we all know that's the bitterest, and that's what, with our optimism, we aim to avoid. Thank you very much. Thank you.